to Jude? Steve looked at me this morning and said, Pastor, I've never done Jude before. Good. Okay. Hopefully you'll see something and hear something really exciting. It'll light your fire today. I'm going to begin, we're going to look at the first four verses of Jude this morning in a five-week series. And you can see the title, there's a reason why I titled it what I did. You'll, you'll get it as we go along further in the message. But I want to talk about this phrase today, a call to action. You ever heard that phrase before used, a call to action? And in that phrase, called to action, it demands an urgent, immediate, and intentional attention to something. I don't call, we don't call somebody to action only for us to say, eh, we'll get to it when we get to it. Or we'll get back and we'll relax in our sofas and take it easy. No, when there's a call to action, there's something that needs to be done immediately. And I think about, I think about emergencies, right? Have you ever experienced emergencies in your life of one form or another? Man, when that emergency hit, you didn't say, I will take care of it tomorrow, right? I I had a mini emergency last night. (laughs) Thank God for Pat, (laughs) Brother Pat, helping me. But I spent all day moving, and we had made multiple trips back and forth, getting our stuff out of storage, and finally everything into our home. And my mini emergency was I dropped off the truck over here, Uh, at Kruger's Hardware, and I went to start my van, and click, 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 click. (laughs) It's like, oh. Part of me wanted to put it off and said, oh, you know what, I'll just sleep in the van, and I'll come to church in the morning. (laughs) At least I couldn't bring my stuff. No, it was a a mini emergency, but it was a call to action. So I got on the phone, and I called Pat, and Pat came over, and thank God, was gracious enough to help me get the van started and emergency averted, right? You all get where I'm going with this, right? Well, that's what I want to talk. I want to talk about in a greater way what's going on in the the church in both Jude's day and in ours. And there's an urgency and a call to action on the part of every believer, both in the local church here and in the universal church. Let me me share with you a quote from K. Arthur. This is back in 2008. I heard Kay say this. We were, Lisa and I were actually studying the book of Jude back in 2008, and we had a chance to hear her speak. And this is what she said. And it, it, you know what? It, it rang true in 2008, but it rings true even more so as we look at the urgency of the last days. She said, Tolerance has threatened the health of the body of Christ because we've glorified the individual through relativity and have become indifferent to truth. The modern church in America today, it's all about glorifying the individual. The messages that are coming out of pulpits, it's all about you, 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 me, me, me. God forbid. Thank God for godly men who stand in pulpits today declaring the truth of God's word. And for dear women like Kay Arthur who stand on the truth of God's word because we are living in a day even 12 years later where the church is in a mess because of what's going on. And, and, and in my notes I had written at the time 2008 seeker sensitivity. The seeker sensitive church where it's all about the felt needs of the lost. We've got we to meet all their needs. And by doing so, we've got to lower the standard of the word of God so we can get them in. When were we ever called in scripture to lower the standard of the truth of God's word to get them in? I looked this morning. It would have been easy to be discouraged to see this small group of people Why aren't there more people here? You know what? I did just the opposite this morning, church. I celebrated every one of you that was here this morning. I'm not going to worry about the ones who are in the door. I'm going to worry and feed the ones who are here. And I was so grateful as I looked around and saw all of you this morning coming to hear, to worship and hear God's word. There is a reason why I'm preaching this message in light of the state of the church today. 
So let's talk about this call to action. Let me read Jude 1 through 4, and then I'll walk us through the different points I have about the call to action. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James. To those who are the called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing to, that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and de deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. So what do we see in this call to action? There's five things that I want to show us about this call to action this morning. First of all, the, relate, the relator of this call to action, or the writer. Talk about the writer uh, up front. He identifies himself right straight up front and says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother James. So let me start. I'm actually going to flip it. I'm going to talk about the brother of James first. It'll make sense in a minute. The brother of James. Well, who's James? Right? But if you do some cross-referencing, right? And you go into Matthew 13, 55, Mark 6, 3, and John 7, 3 through 5, you discover that Jude, which, by the way, would have been translated Judas, not Jude, Judas. Jude is the Greek form of his Hebrew name. Judas, or Jude, which, by the way, was a common name, Jude, is the brother of James, and if you look at those three texts I just gave you, you discover they're whose brother? They're Jesus' brother. Jesus' half-brother. You say, well, pastor, how can he be half-brother? Well, the fact that they, had, they shared a common mother, but they had different fathers, right? Jesus did not share the common brother, uh, this common father of his brothers and sisters because his heavenly father was his father by the power of the Holy Spirit, Right? That's the virgin birth. And I'll just say this. Years ago, I remember somebody saying to me, oh, uh, Jesus doesn't have any brothers and sisters. Oh, really? Can I take you some scriptures? Not only did he have brothers who were named, but he also had sisters who were unnamed. He had siblings that came after him. So he's basically saying, I'm the brother of Jesus. Now, why doesn't he say I'm the brother of Jesus? I mean, that's clout. In the spiritual world, that's clout. I'm the brother of Jesus. Why? Because I think Jude was a humble man. I really believe he was a humble man. How do we know that? Because if you go back to what he starts writing, he says, the bondservant of Jesus Christ. Notice he doesn't say the brother of Jesus Christ. He says the bondservant of Jesus Christ. Think about that. Bondservant. It's one, it's, it's one who's spoken of in voluntary service. Now think about this. At one point, See, this is why I think this message is so cool and why God chose Jude to write it. Because at one point, when you look at Matthew 13 and Mark 6 and John 7, Jude was not a believer in Jesus Christ. None of his brothers were. They rejected him. They did not believe he was the Messiah. But after he was crucified and raised from the dead, God opened their eyes and they realized that their half-brother was the Messiah, the one who brought life. Do you think Jude is going to be excited as he writes this letter? Yeah, we're going to see that. But he's a bondservant of Jesus Christ who's, in a sense, writing to fellow bondservants. Let me just say this up front. I waited till the end of the message, but since it's on my heart, let me say it. Notice Jude doesn't ever write this to pastors. He doesn't say, well, pastors contend for the faith. This is written to all believers, Right? Not just for shepherds, but it's written for all believers to do what he is going to call us to do. So what you've got here is you've got the relator of this call to action. Then in verse 1, you have the recipients of, the call, of the, this call to action. Look at what he says about believers. He says, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. The word called here, 
It's talking about the divine call to salvation. One that, one that God brings to salvation and then conforms them to his saving purposes so that he could use them, right? And another way of saying it is the effectual calling of believers. Okay, remember back in Ephesians, we talked about those who were chosen before the foundation of the world, right? When you hear me use the phrase effectual calling, the effectual calling is the day that salvation actually took effect. So for me, it would be August 12th, 1984, the day I actually got saved. So he's talking about, the, he's talking about those of us who have been called to God's saving purposes, right? As opposed to God's wrath, which is going to contrast with a group of people in a couple minutes of what's coming for them as opposed to what's coming for us, right? Then he calls us beloved. Dear and precious to God. Now, let me just say something. Um, it, you know, you say, well, pastor, I know you like this inductive Bible study stuff, but why do you do it? Well, this is why I do it. Because if you look at the way the called and the beloved are, they're in the perfect tense. Which means... Anything that's in the perfect tense is something that happened in the past and it continues to be true in the future. So what he's saying is, you weren't just called at one particular point in time and it's done. You weren't just beloved at one particular point in time. You were beloved and you continue to be beloved. You were called and you continue to be called. Now think about why that's important because as we get ready to talk about this fight we're in, you need to know that. You need to know who you are in this fight. Because if you don't, and you forget, or you let the enemy lie to you, then you'll give up the fight. You'll say, is the fight worth it? How, by the way, how many of you have ever been in a spiritual fight for your life against the enemy, against unbelievers, and it just got to be so much your flesh wanted to quit? But you won't quit if you remind yourself who you are, you're the called. You're, the, you're beloved, you're precious and dear to God. And then kept. The word kept means guarded over, watched and preserved. And what he's talking here is about this whole idea of salvation. From the, from the day you get saved to the day you get taken home, he's talking about this process of sanctification that we're in. And he said, you're guarded, you're watched over, you're preserved for Jesus Christ that is coming. Right? We're in this for the long haul, folks. And I don't know about you, but mine's been 33 years now. And after 33 years, it can get a little weary at times. And it's, you know, by the way, just, just so you know, you know they always joke about one finger pointing out how many pointing back I could say it this way this morning this message isn't just for you it's for me as well I need to be reminded in this battle in this fight that we're going to talk about who I am because we get lax we forget God wants to remind us that we're kept and I, I love this it's so it's time about the sanctification process but it's interesting in the Greek, this word kept carries with it this idea as well of to be picked up in filth and unusable and made usable. <laughs> Think about that. Picked up in filth. I don't know about you, but I look at my life before Jesus Christ and I was in the, living in the filth of sin and unusable by God. But because he called me, because he be I'm beloved to him, he saved me for his purposes, I'm now cleaned up and usable. Does anybody, is anybody encouraged by that this morning? Think about what you were like before Christ, and now you're cleaned up and you're usable, you're saved by God, and you have a purpose. May, if I can pick on you for a minute. I've heard May say this. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in my 80s, and I'm still wondering what my purpose is. Well, sister, this is one of them right here. God has saved you to use you. Just be, be you in Christ. And, and that will be enough for God. Right? Because the enemy is probably lying in your head. Look at you're old and you're no good. And I, I'm sure he's done that. And you just need to remind him this morning, sister. I am used of God. I am usable by God. God is using me. 
Even if it's just a smile, even if it's just an encouraging word to somebody, or just telling them how great Jesus is, don't let the devil beat you down. Remember who you are in this battle, right? I absolutely love that. It's a reminder who we are, and we're going to be told in a minute what we need to do. But I want to look at verse 2 as well, the resources in the, this call to action. What are the resources we have? Not only do we know who we are, but we have resources. He says, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Now the word may there really is saying, this is my wish for you. This is my prayer for you. This is what I want for you, beloved. Right? This is what he's praying for them. For three things. That mercy, peace, and love be multiplied. What does he mean by multiplied? He means abounding. Not just a trickle, but lots of it. And think about where it's coming from. Where is he asking for these things to come from? From God. May God super abundantly give you, not a trickle, but more and more and more of his mercy, his peace, and love. The idea of mercy, we know what mercy means, right? Grace, we know grace is a, is a free gift, not deserved, given to us. We, we see that in salvation. Mercy is not giving us what we deserve. And so by God not giving us his wrath that we deserve through Jesus Christ, as we are called, the word mercy can mean not only not getting what you deserve, but it's all the blessings over on top of that. Ephesians chapter 1. Go back and read Ephesians 1 again. And look at all the spiritual blessings we have in Christ. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I am, I'm asking God just to multiply this all over to you. And you'll remember it and understand it. You feel, does anybody feel encouraged already? And we haven't even got, we just, we're starting with who we are and what we have accessible, right? And then, peace. It's that peace which comes as a result of God's mercy. And he wants it to abound, this peace, this ever knowing that we are in a right relationship with God. Romans 5, 1. Because we're justified, we now have peace with God and we stand in his grace. So grace and peace go together, right? And it's the idea in the Greek that you stand in it not just once, but you stand in it continually. So what he's saying is, I want you to understand that you stand in God's peace continually. If you ever hear a believer say, I'm not at peace with God, that's not biblical. Because God has settled once and for all through the reconciliation by faith in Jesus Christ that we have peace with him forever. Now we may not be living the way we should, but God's no longer at war with us because of Christ. We have his peace. And he's saying, I wish that this would just abound to you and you would understand it. Then love, I love this. What he's talking about here is the love of God through Christ. That you would just understand that his love is abounding to you. Romans 5.5. 5. You can write it down as a cross reference. We'll be coming to it soon in our study. But he's talking about, in that context, he's talking about trials and you know, going through suffering and, and trials, we can exalt in our trials because they bring about perseverance. They cause us to go on. The more we go through them, the better we are able to face other trials. And then he says, out of that, well, proven out of that comes proven character. Proven character. We become more and more refined to be like Jesus. And then he says, out of that, Hope, hope doesn't disappoint because hope comes from the love of God being poured out in our spirits by the Holy Spirit. It's this overflowing understanding that God's love is super abounding to us. All of these are super abounding. They're not something that you get once. It's not like God saves you, Steve, and then shuts off the faucet. Oh, you got what you need. No, God's faucet is turned on. And what he's saying is, I, basically, I wish you would recognize it. Would you understand that this is what God has for you as resources in your ever-increasing walk with Christ? 
These are the results of salvation. Mercy, peace, and love are the results of salvation that Jude wants them to experience in abundance so we can do what we need to do. Now, now that I've got you... Okay, you know what this reminds me of, church? Anybody ever played sports? Anybody remember being in the locker room with the coach giving you the rah-rah before the game? It's almost as if verses one and two is the rah-rah before the game. You know what? You, you, by the time you get to verse three, you're ready to go, aren't you? Because of who you are. It's, it's like, I feel like this is the cheerleader speech this morning. I, again, I don't know why God, I know why God brought me to Jude, but I don't know why God brought me to Jude for you. Maybe you're discouraged. Maybe you're, you're trying to fight this fight of faith and you're fighting the battle and you're ready to quit. And maybe this morning, and by the way, those who are watching on Facebook and who are gonna watch later, maybe this message is for you as well. That maybe you're ready to quit in the fight and Jesus spoke this morning and said, keep on going, child. Keep on going. Because the fight's worth it, right? Absolutely worth it. Now, I want us to look in verse 3 at the request of this call. So it says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt it necessary to write to you about something else. How many of you have ever started a letter? How many of you still write letters? Thank God. I mean, you know what? Those are, those are fun to get in the mail. I mean, an email's okay, but isn't it nice to get a card in the mail, to get a letter in the mail? How many of you have ever start writing a letter, and as you were writing the letter, your whole train of thought just switched, and you never ended up writing about what you started writing about. You got onto something else, right? There was an urgency for that. That's what's going on with Jude here. He says, I wanted to write to you about common salvation. Now think about this. Think about what I said a couple minutes ago about Jude's relationship to Jesus. He had not been always a believer in his brother as the Messiah. But at some point, probably not long before this, God opened his eyes to see the truth about who Christ was in terms of salvation, his death and resurrection and all that, that he truly was Lord and Master that he's going to mention at the end. He was the king. He was it. If it, hasn't, if it wasn't long before that, that he tra- think about how excited he is to write about common salvation. What's he talking about? He's talking about the shared salvation that we all have in Christ. I don't even need to say more about that. That shared salvation that we all have in Jesus Christ. So he's, he's about to write about that. He, was, he, was, he says, I, made, I was making every effort. I was earnestly putting forth effort. I was diligently wanting to write to you about the shared salvation that we all have. You can just feel his excitement. And what, what salvation is he talking about? It's the idea of deliverance from sin and its spiritual consequences. It's talking about deliverance from destruction and being preserved. He's talking about the fact that we no longer through Christ have to experience God's wrath. Do you think that might get Jude a little excited? He's probably excited to share this, talk about it in the letter, but something happens. Something happens early on in the letter. He said, as I was making every effort to talk to you about that, I felt the necessity to write to appealing to you to earnestly contend for the faith. So as excited as he was about writing about this common salvation they shared, he he felt it necessary. Okay, the word necessary means necessary. Necessary. I can't put it off. I've got to do it. And how did he do it? The scripture doesn't tell us, but I can almost guarantee that if you believe the scripture was written through men by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it was the Holy Spirit that was prompting him to change his direction. By the way, he never does get back to talking about salvation, as it were, per se, in the book. He's He's being stirred by the Holy Spirit, and he says to them, I, was, I found it necessary to write to appealing to you. Appealing, which means begging, pleading with you. 
That's how necessary it was. Begging and pleading that you earnestly contend for the faith. The word faith, contend earnestly, means to fight for something. And what's the faith he's talking about? He's talking about Christian doctrine, truth. Or all the gospel and all that Christianity stands for. I, I'm, asking you, I'm, not, I'm, I'm asking you to contend for that. Fight for that. Does that seem appropriate to today? Do we need to contend earnestly for the faith today? And look at what he goes on to say. That was once and for all handed down to the saints. The word once and for all means once and never again. It has perpetual validity, and it doesn't need to be repeated. Now you say, Pastor, why are you preaching this message? Because everybody and his brother standing in pulpits and writing books today thinks that we have the right to change this. I don't know about you, but I think it's good enough the first time. Right? Right? Where does man get off thinking we can change the words of God? I don't know about you, but I think God knows what he's doing. And yet, unfortunately, there are many people standing in pulpits today, writing books, singing songs that just absolutely undermine the word of God. We need to contend for the faith. We need to be Bereans, Acts 17, 11. Even when it comes to this man standing behind this pulpit and standing behind that podium in the other room on Thursday nights, you need to make sure that what you're getting from me is the word of God. You need to be a Berean. You need to contend for the faith. And I'll say this up front, you can't contend if you don't know it. Now you know I am so heavy and hard into studying God's word. You can't contend for what you don't know. That's why I'm, my heart is so much to give you and teach you how to study God's word for yourself so that you can contend. You don't always need the pastor in your back pocket because you're learning it yourself, right? I want to give you another scripture about contending for the faith. 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 14. And as we go there, I, I just want to share this thought in relation to that. 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 14. I'm going to find it. It's after Thessalonians. There we go. Okay. I want us to think about this idea of fighting or contending for something. Here it means to, to fight with the word. To fight for and to fight against. And what I believe is happening in our culture today is Orthodox Christianity is in a fight with progressive Christianity. Y'all know what I mean by progressive Christianity. Let me give you a quick definition. Progressive Christianity basically says this, this is old and outdated and needs to be updated to something new and progressive. Guys like Rob Bell. How many of you have ever heard of Rob Bell? Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, sister. Rob Bell was a teacher in um, Mars Hill at a church in uh, Michigan when we lived there. Not actually, not far away. He wrote he wrote things like Elvet, uh, Velvet Elvis. He wrote um, Love Wins. Right. He he's the one. He's a false teacher who believes that love will win in the end, everyone will be, will be saved in the end. He teaches universal salvation. He believes everybody will be saved in the end because, because even after you die, the irresistible grace of God will reach you in Hades or whatever and will win you to Christ. I'll go, where, where is that in Scripture? This progressive Christian, there's all kinds of health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. How many of you know? Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, Joyce Meyer, Joel Osteen. That's all progressive Christianity. Somehow thinking that God got it wrong the first time and man has to come and add a new revelation to it. We are in a fight. Even in our music with Hillsong and Bethel. Garbage, garbage, garbage teaching. Bill Johnson is a false 
teacher. I'm not afraid to call out false teachers from this pulpit because I think it's what God wants me to do because if you look at Acts chapter 20, where Paul is meeting with the Ephesian elders and he says, you know, after, be on guard against, uh, as overseers of the flock, made overseers by the Holy Spirit. Talking to the leadership and he says, be on guard because after I leave, there'll be wolves that come in and they'll try to draw away the flock and make disciples after themselves. Who do you think he was talking about? Guys that Jude is writing about in this book. Right? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. I, I love it. Even though he's writing to a pastor, I don't believe this is just for pastors. Right? Paul in verse 12 says, For this reason I also suffer these things. He's talking about suffering for the sake of Christ. But I'm not ashamed, for I know what I've believed and whom I've believed. I'm convinced that he's able to guard what I've entrusted to him until that day. Then he says, retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. I love this. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which, which has been entrusted to you. What's been entrusted to us, believers? The word of God and the gospel, entrusted. So if we've been entrusted with it, we got to guard it against even false teachers that come into the church, Okay? All right. Wow. This is what we need to do as the called, beloved, and kept. This is what we, this is our job. And again, I'll reiterate, he doesn't say anything about it being pastors. I believe he's talking here to all believers. It is all of our responsibility to guard this treasure. And then, if you look at, so we saw the request of this call to action, and it's an earnest one, it's an urgent one, then we see the reason for this call to action in verse 4. For he says, for certain persons have crept in unnoticed. <laughs> oh, they've crept in unnoticed, all right. And I'll tell you what, as I was studying this a while back, I thought to myself, how do they creep in unnoticed? Well, there's a couple ways. One is, when the church lets his guard down and doesn't study God's word, they'll come in and people will buy into anything. Because it sounds good. False teachers sound good. Another thing that really struck me, and again, going back to the whole Rob Bell illustration. Do you know Rob Bell did not start out as a quote-unquote false teacher? Do you know he went to Moody Bible? Anybody know anything in here about Moody Bible? Moody Bible is rock-solid orthodox. How does a guy who goes to Moody Bible end up on the other end? They started out looking good. That's why when they... When they come in, they look, you, they're unnoticed. Oh, they're one of us. And I was talking to somebody just the other day, and this illustration came up. Kind of like if you want to you wanna boil a frog, you don't, you don't light the fire and boil the frog and throw them in. Because the frog's not stupid, the frog will jump out. And what do you do? You put them in lukewarm water, and you gradually increase the temperature. So the frog, the frog gets accommodated with it, and before you know it, the frog has died. What's happened in the church? Little by little, Satan has crept in a little bit at a time to the point where it's like, oh, that's not so bad, oh, that's not so bad, that's not so bad. Before you know it, here's where you are. And by the way, why is this so urgent call to action, church? Because we are living in the days when, I, I, I'm going to be honest with you, I believe there's a remnant of, true believers in the body of Christ. I believe many people who are in church today aren't even really born again. I believe God is going to call a remnant out of the church in the last days just like he did with Israel. Right? And what's scary is the stuff, and, and I'll say this up front, I think my number one knock on the church today is absolute lack of discernment. Lack of discernment in God's word. I mean, if you, honestly, if you listen to some of the stuff that's on Facebook and some of the stuff that's coming out of pulpits and stuff like that, if you have an inch of discernment in God's word, you're going to say, that is, pfft. right? People are sucking this stuff up. People are getting hauled into it. I mean, it's amazing. Like, 
Like, for, for instance, I'll give you a quick example. Um, how many of you have heard of Todd Bentley? That group that hangs with them. Um, they basically are luring our youth astray, right? Because they look good on the outside. They're all about signs and wonders and miracles, and there's nothing wrong with signs and wonders and miracles, except for the fact that if you listen to uh, T.A. McMahon from the Berean Call, a wonderful man of God, just go to thebereancall.com. He's their, their boy. He, he, Dave Hunt, who went to be with the Lord, was with him. They started T.A. McMahon. I heard him share recently uh, this idea that, that the problem with that particular group right now that's crept into the church, that's just growing and growing and growing, is the fact that there's nothing wrong with, with miracles and all that, but miracles accompanied the gospel. If you look in the early, the book of Acts and the Gospels, miracles accompanied the gospel as a verification that the gospel was true before the word of God was written. The problem is, these guys have replaced the gospel with miracles. It's all about experience, right? And they're luring our people astray. They're luring our youth astray. So they've crept in unnoticed. Like Rob Bell, he crept in unnoticed and what do they do why are they so, why is such an urgent call to action listen to what he says i'm going to i'm going to jump ahead and go cuz he he explains who they are ungodly persons who turn the grace of god into licentiousness okay so they're ungodly the word ungodly here doesn't mean irreligious it doesn't mean those godless people like are li living in the world, living for self. It's not talking about the group we talked about in the, last week's message. It's talking about those who have a form of godliness, but they deny its power by the way they live. That's what he's talking about. These are ungodly. They, they claim to be godly, but they're not. Why? Because what are they doing? They're turning the grace of God into licentiousness or a license to sin. Now, I want you to think with me for a minute. The grace of, the response to the grace of God should be what, church? Think about what Romans 6, 1 says. Should we go on sinning so that grace might abound? No, by no means, Paul says. Don't you know that those who are, you know, identify with Christ, and he goes on in Romans 6 to talk about living a godly life. So the right response to God's grace for us is to live in response by living a holy life. These guys have come in and done just the opposite. And you go, Pastor, really? Is that happening? Uh-huh. How many of you are aware of a movement called the hyper-grace movement? God, you guys really need to write this stuff and go check it out. Hyper grace movement. We actually are affected by it because we have, we have actually friends of ours whose children are under this hyper grace movement. And I love them dearly, but, but this, is what, this is what, dear pastor friend of mine back in Michigan, his daughter would say to my, my friend Emilio, oh dad, God doesn't bring judgment anymore. We're under grace now. They're being taught that by their pastor. One of the rock star pastors, right? You know what I mean when I say a rock star pastor? You know, the ones in their skinny jeans and they're cool. Who's the, who's the guy out um, um, Hillsong out in New York City? You know who I mean, the Hillsong pastor out there? He's a rock star pastor, right? He's a rock star pastor, but he, what was his name? Yeah, right? These guys, they're not preaching the truth. Those guys have crept in, and the, the church is just sucking it up. Why? Because they're cool. If a pastor dresses cool, he's got to be cool, right? No, your pastor's cool only if he teaches the truth out of God's word. And by the way, let me just say this. Let's, let's give kudos to guys like myself who have small churches who faithfully, week after week, teach the word of God. Who's giving them the kudos? Because we're not rock stars, right? But you know, when it comes down to the end, God's going to look at us who declare God's word faithfully and say, well done, good and faithful servant. He's going to look at them. We're going to find out in a minute what he's going to do to them, right? But again, this hyper grace movement. Since we're living under grace, we can do whatever we want. And these guys come in silver-tongued. 
And they can get you to believe if you're not careful, if you're undiscerning, you might get drawn in by this. That's what he says. They turn the grace of God into, a li- into licentiousness, a license to sin. It's all about pleasure for them. I mean, think about Joel Osteen, your best life now. I don't see a whole lot about Jesus and the gospel and preaching against sin. It's your best life now, right? Well, Joel, you know what? Your best life is now. Because what's coming for you is the best it's going to get for you, Joel. Right? Those false, and by the way, you'll hear me say this in a minute, don't feel sorry for them. God doesn't want us to feel sorry for them, okay? So they turn the grace of God into the license to sin in terms of what it should be. And by the way, the word turn here, to turn into something, literally means to use something for the purpose at which it wasn't intended, using it for another purpose. And that's what these guys are doing. So they transfer into another purpose And by doing so, listen to what it says carefully. This is so cool. I don't know if you noticed this. He says, in doing so, so they've they've ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into a license and deny, what's the, what's the possessive there? It's not their master and Lord Jesus Christ. It's our. Why doesn't Jude say their? Because these guys had never been saved. They're not saved. It's not like they turned away. They never were saved. He's talking about our Lord. They're denying our Lord and Master by doing that. That should be offensive to us, church. Totally offensive to us. What they've done with the grace that our Lord and Master paid for our salvation. We should be offended by what they're doing. Are we? I hope we are. And then finally, listen to what he says. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. So the very condemnation that we should have received had we not been called and kept, God's got them marked out for it. And you say, well, marked out long beforehand. Yes, in ages past. Long before they ever crept into the church, before the church was even a thing, God already had them marked out for condemnation. And I I love the analogy. This is what it literally means. Back in the old days, when when somebody was was going to be sentenced, they would put their picture up or put their name up as a public notice, up for sentencing. And then the sentencing would come and they'd be condemned. It's kind of like, you know, remember the old FBI, 10 Most Wanted? The 10 Most Wanted, these guys are wanted and and when they get caught, they're going to get punished, Right? It's kind of like God's most wanted. God's got their pictures up and he said long before they ever did what they did, they had been marked out for condemnation. So tell me, are these people believers? Absolutely not. And well, maybe they're doing this innocently, pastor. They don't even aware of it. They crept in unnoticed. How can they be innocent if they've crept in unnoticed? It means to creep in craftily. These guys know what they're doing. So I'm going to tell you, church, today, don't feel sorry for them. Do not. And you say, well, we'll pray for their salvation. If they've been marked long ago before condemnation, the sentence that's due, that condemnation's coming. They cannot be saved. But what should we be doing? We should be pointing them out. We should be guarding the gospel. We should be guarding the doctrine and pointing people to the truth about them. Let me share this real quickly. Just so you know, there's historical context to this. There, is a, there's a, there was a group during Jude's day, during Paul's day, during all of their days, and there was a, there was a teaching called Libertine Gnosticism. Gnostics believed they had a special revelation from God. Now, if you think about it, and you listen to, you listen to these people who call themselves apostles and prophets, and the Lord revealed new truth to me. I mean, you just listen to some of these false teachers. God gave me a, spe- you know, gave me a revelation, and it's like, if you only were like me, you'd have that special revelation. Well, nowhere in Scripture does God ever give a special revelation to one group of people over the body of Christ. They believe that they they taught that the flesh is evil and the spirit's good, which is basically Greek thinking. That's what the Greeks thought. They weren't being inspired by by God. They were being inspired by the culture, right? And so since the flesh is evil, then we can go ahead and do whatever we want. 
No, 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 no. What does Romans 6 say? It talks about the flesh, about sanctifying the flesh, surrendering, you know, to, to Jesus in the flesh. And I think a lot of this is talking about sensuality, the health, health wealth, and prosperity gospel. I've already talked. So, so what do we do with all this, church? First of all, we ought to go, whoa. And by the way, I'm telling you, if you don't believe me, and Kathy knows this because I know Kathy and I are on the same page with this and we, we, we search stuff like this. But if you're not aware, go Google some of these pastors. Seriously. And some of these false teachers. It's creeping in to the church. And I hate to say it, but even people who've looked orthodox for a long time are now starting to allow this stuff to creep into their teaching. Stuff that is not God. So, here's the question. Do you understand who you are as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? From the book of Jude. And do you understand your incredible responsibility of contending for the faith in light of this? This is not just for pastors. Church, we're counting on you. We who are pastors are counting on the flock to be contenders for the faith. Right? Do you know the faith which you need to contend for? Do you know this? And if you don't, there's only one way to know it. Get into it. Start studying it. And what are we personally doing each day to contend for the faith? Are we, and we have a platform that Jude didn't have. We have Facebook. What are we doing on Facebook to contend for the faith? Are we calling out false teaching, right? And we may not be calling out false teachers, but we could be calling out people who have been influenced by false teaching. Are we calling them out in love and just saying, are you truly believe that? Let's look at what God's word says because God's word is a treasure to be guarded. What are we doing? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word in Jude. We thank you for the precious, precious, precious gift of your word that we are to guard as a treasure with the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we were never intended to, to do anything with your word other than to study it, to understand it properly, and to live it out. You never gave us permission to twist it to make it say what we wanted to say to meet our own needs. Father God, help us to know your word and be able to earnestly contend for the faith. Lord, would you equip your saints here at Whiting Community Baptist Church through the study of their word to be able to contend earnestly for the faith. Lord, we're in a battle and we know that you've got our back in the battle. And if we'll do what we're called to do, you will come alongside us and do what we, you need to do to help us contend. Give us the strength, give us the words, give us the wisdom. Lord, we give you the honor and glory as we sing this final song. In Jesus' name we pray.